Let us pray. Father, we thank you once again because of the opportunity you are giving to us to meet once again today. Accept our thanks, accept our praises, accept our adorations in Jesus' name. Father, we commit to this study into your hand that you are going to be with us from the beginning to the very end. And you are going to see us through successfully. Father, we are praying, we are asking that your, in your infinite mercy and love, you are going to speak directly to us from your throne in the name of Jesus. Our heart desire is to be like you. Our heart desire is to be holy like you. Our heart desire is to with power like you. Because we are your children. Father, we pray. Even in today's service, release your power into our life in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, the world is looking unto us as your representative upon the face of the earth. And there is nothing we can do by our own power, by our own strength. Therefore, we need your power. We need your anointing. Father, in today's lecture, we are praying and we are asking that you are going to release your power into our life so that we are going to be your true representatives indeed in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, because we believe you have answered Lord. Father, we pray, let your work come out with power in the name of Jesus Christ and let it have express way into our heart, into our life, in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Today we are talking about kingdom of power. And we are taking our test from Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Let's open our Bible together. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, having seen of them forty days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. For forty good days, that Jesus Christ had the opportunity to be on the earth after resurrection, before he ascended to heaven. He was speaking the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, to the disciples. And we have been examining what are the things that are pertaining to the kingdom of God. We have seen holiness is the characteristics of God, and therefore his kingdom is holy. And the people there take holiness very seriously. Yesterday, we also learned that God is law. And we also see that his kingdom is characterized by law. And today, we want to see how God with power, how all power belongs unto God. And so that we will be able to understand that his kingdom and the citizens of his kingdom also must demonstrate the power of God. Look at Psalm 62, I read verse 11. Psalm 62, I read verse 11. Psalm 62, verse 11. Let's open our Bible together as we read. Psalm 62, verse 11. Look at verse 11. God has spoken once, twice have I had this, that power belongeth unto God. Power belongs to our God. And the Lord Jesus Christ also put it in this way. Look at Matthew 28. Matthew chapter 28, we read verse 18. Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power is given to the Lord Jesus Christ. Power belongs to our God. And because he's a powerful God, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that he cannot do. Look at Genesis chapter 18, I read from verse 9. Genesis chapter 18, I read from verse 9. Genesis chapter 18, I read from verse 9. Let's read it together, Genesis chapter 18, verse 9. 
And they said unto him, Where is Sarah, thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, I have a son. And Sarah had it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and were stricken in age. And he ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am wax old, shall I have pleasure? My Lord also, my Lord being also, my Lord being old also. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Salai of a swarty, be a son, which I am old. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. As at the time that God is speaking to Abraham, Sarah, is, Sarah was already 89 years, and Abraham was already 99 years. In human calculation, in human reasoning, it is impossible for a woman of that age to have a child, to become pregnant. But God Almighty has all power. He's a powerful God. He can do all things. So he was telling Sarah, he was telling Abraham, he said, by this time next year, Abraham, Sarah will carry your baby. We give back to a baby. And Sarah had it inside the house and she was loving. And say, what kind of joke is these people making? You say that I'm going to be pregnant, become pregnant. At this age, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 37. Luke chapter 1, verse 37. Luke chapter 1, verse 37. The Bible says, For with God, nothing shall be impossible. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. The reason is because God has all power and he can do anything. The only thing he cannot do is what he doesn't want to do. As far as he's concerned, once he determined that he wants to do anything, nothing can hinder him. Look at Jeremiah chapter 32, I read verse 17. Jeremiah chapter 32, I read verse 17. How Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power, and stretch out and, and stretch out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. For thee, there is nothing too hard for our God. Anything that He wants to do, He does it. Nothing can hinder Him. Nothing can prevent Him. He is the Almighty God. Look at Genesis chapter eighteen. Genesis chapter eighteen. I read. First one in Genesis chapter 17. I read first one. Look at first one. And when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. God is the Almighty, He is the possessor of all the power in heaven. And in, on the earth, there is nothing impossible for him to do. And he's our king. He's the king that is ruling the kingdom of God. And because he has power, he also shared that power with all the citizens of the kingdom. So every kingdom, every citizen in the kingdom of God has power. God released that power unto us through his spirit. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. Let us read together. 1 John chapter 4, I read verse 13. Look at verse 13. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. 
God has given us of his spirit, and that spirit of God in us also gives us power. But there are five levels of power. So there are five levels of power. There is power for sonship. There is power for witnessing. There is great power for witnessing. There is greater power for witnessing. And there is greatest power for witnessing. So we are going to look at each of the levels of power. Each of the levels of power. And the levels of power are symbolized. Are symbolized. The first level of power is symbolized by wind. The second level of power is symbolized by fire. The third level of power is symbolized by earthquake. And the fourth level of power is symbolized by still small voice. And the last, the fifth level of power is symbolized by resurrection. Resurrection. Let us first look at these symbols before we begin to discuss this level of power one by one. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I read from verse 1. Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> I read from verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them clothing tongue, clothing tongues like us of fire. And he sat upon each of them. As you look at this Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, he's talking about the incoming of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. And as you read that particular passage, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, you will discover there are certain symbols that was used to symbolize, to represent the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 2. And suddenly there came sand from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Wind is a level, a measure of the Holy Spirit. And when you read it further to verse 3, you see another symbol. In verse 3, and there appear unto them clothing tongues like as of fire. You see, fire is another level. But that is not the only two levels. There are other levels as well. Look at First King, First King, chapter nineteen. First King, chapter nineteen. First King. Let's open our Bible together and read it together. First King, chapter nineteen. I read verse eleven. And he said, "Are you there?" First King, chapter nineteen, verse eleven. And he said, "Go forth." and stand upon the mount before the law and behold the law passed by and a great and strong wind you see that a great and a strong wind that is a level of the holy ghost wind level wind level wind level just as we have seen also in the book of acts chapter 2 there is wind level of holy ghost let's read it again verse 11 and he said go forth and start upon the month before the law and behold the law passed by and a great and strong wind rent the mountain and break in pieces the rock before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small foil. You see, four levels of the Holy Spirit are explain in that play the first level is wind level the second level is fire level the third level is at quick level and the last level is still small voice level but when you look at this first king chapter 19 verse 11 to 12 you will discover that the fire and the earthquake was placed before fire the reason why was that is because the anointing upon elijah who saw this revelation was the fire so 
his anointing was the fire. That's why fire came last in this arrangement. Under normal arrangement, under normal condition, it is like this. Level one, wind. Level two, fire. Level three, earthquake. Level four, still small voice. And level five is not here because that is God himself. It is greatest power. It is represented by resurrection. That's why Jesus said, I am resurrection and life. So these are the five levels. Number one, wind level. Number two, fire level. Number three, earthquake level. Number four, still small voice level. And lastly, number five, resurrection. These are the five levels. The wind level correspond to the power for sonship. The fire level corresponds to power for witnessing. The earthquake level corresponds to great power for witnessing. And the still small voice corresponds to greater power for witnessing. And resurrection corresponds to the greatest power. We look at these five levels of power one by one. And so you will know which level you have and which level you need to move to so that you can demonstrate the power of God in this world. And the Lord will help us as we go through these studies in Jesus' name. Look at number one, power for sonship. That is number one that we want to consider power for sonship and we say that is the wind level look at Acts, act chapter 2 power for sonship we say that is the wind level look at Acts chapter 2 Acts chapter 2 Acts chapter 2 we read first one and two and when the day of pentecost was fully come they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and filled all the house where they were sitting mighty wind you see that that is the same thing we see in first king chapter 19 let's go back to first king chapter 19 again first king chapter 19 i read first 11. let's read it together again and see wind level we say that is the power for sonship look at first king chapter 19 verse 11 again and he said go forth and stand upon the mount before the lord and behold the lord passed by and a great and strong wind hath call it mighty wind the first king chapter 19 call it strong wind it's still wind that's wind anointing. Now, the question we want to ask ourselves is that what is the purpose of wind anointing? When we receive the Holy Ghost at the measure of the wind, what is he to do in our life? Look at Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. Let's open our Bible together. Ezekiel chapter 37. We read from verse 9. Ezekiel 37 from first nine let's read it together first nine then said he to me prophesy unto the wind prophesy son of man and say unto the wind does hear the law come from the four winds o o breath and breath upon this lane that they may live so i prophesy as he commanded me and the breath came into them and they live and stood upon their feet an exceeding great army so the wind is what makes something that is dead to come alive that is the anointing the measure of the holy spirit that we receive when we are born again because before we are born again we are dead in sin and trespasses look at uh, in ephesians chapter 2 ephesians chapter 2 Ephesians chapter 2, before we were born again, we were dead, spiritually dead, in sin, in unrighteousness, in iniquity. But when the wind of the Holy Ghost blew up, blew up or not, we came, we, we came, we, we came alive. Look at um, Ephesians chapter 2, I read verse 1. 
and you are still quicken who were dead in trespasses and sin we were dead in trespasses and sin but when we realize our condition and when we come to jesus christ we confess our sin we believe on his name the wind of the holy ghost blow upon us and as a result of that we receive life eternal life look at john chapter 3 john chapter 3 i read verse 15 and 16 john chapter 3 i read verse 3 and verse 15 and 16 john chapter 3 verse 15 and 16 that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life we were given when the wind of the holy ghost blew upon us we were given we are given the life of god eternal life the everlasting life so that is what the wind anointing has done in our life and as a result of that wind anointing we become a child of god we receive the power to become a child of god look at john chapter 1 verse 12 john chapter 1 verse 12 john chapter 1 verse 12 but as many as received him to them gave you power to become the sons of god even even today that believe on his name so we receive power the power we receive as at that point in time is the power of sonship we become a son and daughter of god we are adopted into the kingdom of god look at roman chapter 8 verse 15 roman chapter 8 verse 15 romans chapter 8 verse 15 let's open our bible together roman chapter 8 i read verse 15 for ye have not received the spirit of bondage you see it is the spirit holy spirit we receive but the measure of the holy spirit we receive as at that point in time is the wind level and that's what gives us the power to become the son and the daughter of God. Look at verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit is said, be a, be a, be a witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So that spirit gives us the power, the measure of the wind, spirit that we receive give us the power to become a child of god not only that it gives us the power to become a child of god it also makes us to be alive from spiritual dead we were dead before in sin we came alive we came alive we are conscious again we are conscious of god we are conscious of heaven we are conscious of the things of god that is what that spirit has done in our life and not only that as a result of that that power that was given to her we began to live about sin it is the power to live about sin we began to live about sin look at uh, first john chapter 3 verse 9 first john chapter 3 verse 9 first john chapter 3 verse 9 let's read verse 9 together look at verse 9 he said whosoever is born of god do not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him he cannot sin because he is born of god because by the reason of our new birth now and the power that we have just received now we receive the power to be able to live about sin we are no longer living in sin again as a matter of fact we hate sin we run away from sin our life is totally different now so the power of sonship is the power to live only life look at roman chapter one is the power to live only life look at roman chapter one i read first five roman chapter one i read first five Look at Romans chapter 1, 
Are you there? <clears throat> Are you there? In Romans chapter 1, I read uh, verse uh, 4. And declare to be the Son of God with power, you see, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. That is the spirit we also receive. That's why we are called the Son of God. Son of God are like God. They are as holy as God himself is holy. That's why he said, even as he that has called you is holy, be ye holy in all manner of your conversation. So when we receive the wind level of the Holy Spirit, we receive the power, the anointing to be able to live about sin and uh, when you receive that power when you receive that anointing as well you will begin to begin to live a life that is about sin about reproach that's why the bible say if any man be in christ is a new creature all things are passed away all things are become new look at second corinthians chapter 5 second corinthians chapter 5 i read verse 17 second corinthians chapter 5 i read verse 17 therefore if any man be in christ is a new creature creature all things are passed away behold all things have become new you no longer live in sin again you no longer live in unrighteousness again you hate sin you hate all the works of flesh and you begin to live according to the will and the word of god that is the power we receive as salvation it is called wind, wind level of Holy Ghost. It transforms your life inside out. You receive the strength, you receive the enablement to begin to live a life that is glorifying the name of the Lord. That is the power we receive at the point of salvation. But then, that does, it doesn't end here. Apart from the power of sunset, we also need the power for witnessing. Power for witnessing. That's number two. Power for witness. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Look at verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Let's see verse 8. You see, but yes, I receive power after that the holy ghost is come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in jerusalem and in all judea and in samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth he said when the holy ghost come out he's talking about baptism of holy spirit not the measure that we receive at the salvation the measure that we receive at the point of salvation is the wind level but this one now that he's talking about he said we will receive the power to become a witness he said and that power we call only when the Holy Ghost comes. Look at verse 8 again, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That power is for us to witness about Christ. That power is to tell the people that Jesus Christ died and he has resurrected. That power is to become an effective witness for Christ. That is power for witnessing. But that power for witnessing is the fire level. Look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I read verse 3. Acts chapter 2. I read verse 3. And they and there and there appear unto them clothing tongues as of fire and he sat upon each day upon each of them and they were all filled with the holy ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance they were baptized in the holy ghost they were filled with the holy ghost and as a result of the infilling of the holy ghost they began to speak in another tongues that is fire level. That is when the power for witnessing has come. That is when we begin to preach with power. And when that power came upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost, when they received the fire of the Holy Ghost, when they received the anointing of the Holy Ghost, when they received the baptism of Holy Ghost, just one single sermon preached by Peter converted 3,000 people. Look at Acts chapter 32. I read verse 37. Acts chapter 2. 
Acts chapter 2, I read verse 37. Look at verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sin. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, say, Save yourself from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly receive his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Just one message after the Holy Ghost called upon them like fire, Peter preached a single message, and as a result of that power for witnessing, 3,000 people were converted into the kingdom of God. 3,000 people were brought into the kingdom of God. The same power was what Peter weeded when he met with the layman at the, at, at the beautiful gate. He prayed for the layman immediately. That man was he. That is the fire level of the Holy Ghost. Look at Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful to ask arm of them that enter into the temple who seen peter and john about to go into the temple ask an arm and peter fastening his eyes upon him with john said look or not and he gave heed unto them expecting to receive something of them then peter said sliver and gold have i known but such as i have give i thee in the name of jesus christ of nazareth rise up and walk verse 7 and he took him by the right hand and he lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bone received strength and he leaping up he leaping up stood and walked and enter with them into the temple walking and leaping and praising god you see that that power, that fire power, that the fire, the fire level of the Holy Ghost that came upon them on the day of Pentecost enabled Peter to be able to pray for the layman and the layman was able to walk. You see, that is the power for witnessing. It was the same power that enabled Peter again. He preached at another time. Another 5,000 people got converted. Just a single message. Look at Acts chapter 5. Uh, in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, I read verse 4. Acts chapter 4, I read verse 4. How bet many of them which had the word believe, and the number of them was about 5,000. Another 5,000 was converted. Another 5,000 people were won into the kingdom of God. You see, that is the power for witnessing. The power for witnessing. And we need it. You need it. I need it. Every child of God need it. And you receive that power. You receive the fire after you are baptized in the Holy Ghost. That is the second level of the power of God in the life of his people. But that's not the end. We need to move from fire to the next level, which is earthquake. Earthquake level. Let us see earthquake level. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Are you there with me? Acts chapter 4. I read from verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaking. We had the assembled together. The place was shaking. There was earthquake. Already they had been baptized with the Holy Ghost. Already they have received the fire, but they, want, they now move to the next level. Let us see this next level. And when they had prayed, the place was shaking. There was earthquake. That is earthquake level of Holy Ghost. Let us see it. Verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaking. Where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. 
and they speak the word of God with boldness. This is a, another level of infilling of Holy Ghost. This is called earthquake. You see, this is not fire. You don't see any fire here. The place was shaking. And immediately they were filled with the Holy Ghost. That is the earthquake Holy, uh, Holy Ghost. Paul also experienced this. Uh, Paul also had the same experience. Look at Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. I read verse 25. Acts chapter 16. I read verse 25. And at midnight, are you there? Acts 16:25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas pray and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners had there. Verse 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. You see that? So that the foundation of the prison was shaking. Immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's hand was loose. That is earthquake level of Holy Ghost. Peter experienced it. Paul experienced it. Let us see what happened. After Peter and the disciple experienced the earthquake, earthquake. Let us see what happened in their ministry. Let us see what happened in their life. Let us see the outcome. Let's see the result. Look at Acts chapter four. Let me read again from thirty-one to thirty-three. And when they were, when they had prayed, the place was shaking where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness and the multitude of them that believe were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them that uttered the thing which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Look at verse 33. And with great power. They have moved now from power to great power. They have changed gear. When they receive the earthquake anointing, they receive great power. Verse 33. And with great power gave the apostle, apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And great grace was upon them all. When you come to the level of the earthquake, you receive great power. No longer power, great power. And what will that great power do? After this uh, earthquake experience, you see that P Peter does not even need to pray for people again. It was his ordinary shadow that began to hit the people because he has already got the great power. Look at Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, I read from verse 15. Look at verse 15. Acts chapter 5, I read from verse 15. In so much that they, besought, that they brought forth the sick into the street and laid them on the bed and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. And there came also a multitude out of the city round about, round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirit, and they hid everyone. And they were hid everyone. Just shadow of Peter touching them, sickness was going away, demons was going away. That is great power. What happened to Paul also after he received the earthquake experience? You will see the anchor chief from the body of Paul was sealing the sea. Look at Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, I read verse 11. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, verse 11. And God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick and catches or apron, and the disease departed from there, and the evil spirit went out of there. You see that? That is what happened when you receive earthquake anointing. You don't need to get to where the sick people are and begin to lay their hand, your hand upon them before miracle will take place. And catching for Paul was healing the sick. And catching for Paul was driving out Satan. And the shadow of Peter was healing the sick. That is what happened when you receive the earthquake anointing. Then, after earthquake anointing, there is another one we call it still small voice anointing. There wasn't any record in the Bible. 
that any of the disciples experiencing it, maybe perhaps they say this great power is enough. But the Bible puts it in record there so that we can move up higher. Look at First King, First King chapter 19. First King chapter 19. I read verse 12. First King chapter 19. I read from verse 12. Look at verse 12. First King chapter 19 from verse 12. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, a still small voice. And that is the level Jesus Christ operated. 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 Constantly he was hearing the voice of God. God was telling him to do in every situation, in every circumstance. That is another level, greater than the great power. This is now greater power. Look at John chapter 5. John chapter 5. John chapter 5. I read verse 19. John chapter 5. I read verse 19 and verse 30 together. John chapter 9. John, John chapter 5, verse 19. Look at verse 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he said the Father do for, for, for things soever he doeth, this also doeth the Son likewise. He listened to what the Father is doing. He see what the Father is doing. He was constantly hearing the Father. Look at verse 30. I can of my own self do nothing, but as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not in my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. This is the level of greater power. And that is the level at which Jesus Christ operated. That's why he doesn't hear the same sickness, the same thing, in the same way. Because he was receiving revelation from the Father as to what to do in every circumstance, in every situation. Look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 29. Matthew chapter 9, verse 29. Matthew chapter 9, verse 29. Look at verse 29. Matthew chapter 9, verse 29. Are you there? Let's read together. Then touch ye their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were open, and Jesus strictly charged them, saying, See that no man know ye. He wanted to heal the blind people here. Yeah. God said, Oh, yeah, touch their eyes. He touched their eyes. But in another place, you will discover that it was another method. Look at John chapter 9. John chapter 9. I read from verse 1 to 7. John chapter 9. I read from verse 1 to 7. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was born from his back, which was born blind from his back. And the disciple asked him, say, Master, who did see this man on his spirit that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither at this man's sin nor his spirit, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the work of him that sent me. Why it is day? The night cometh when no man can walk. Look at verse 5. As long as I'm in the war, I am the light of the world. Verse 6. And when he had just spoken, is part on the ground and made clay of the spittle and annoyed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Shiloh, which is by interpretation said. And he went his way therefore and washed and came seeing. This another method. Jesus spied on the ground. He, he, he molded clay and he rubbed the eyes of that man and he asked him to go and wash it. And as he washed it, the man began to see. Look at another method, Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, I read verse 23. Mark chapter 8, I read verse 23. Mark chapter 8, I read verse 23. Look at verse 23. Look at it. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the tongue 
and he has spit on his eyes and put his hand upon him and asked him if he saw us and he looked up and said i see men as three walking after that he put his hand again upon his side and he made him look up and he was restored and saw every man clearly it's another way jesus cried speech or spit on his hand and he rubbed it on the eyes of that man he, after that he now placed his hand upon him and he asked him do you see jesus christ for every problem he listened to the father he was hearing the father constantly 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 the communication line between him and the father is very very vibrant so he never he he was hearing the still small voice of almighty god all the time that is the level of greater power it is the level of still small voice but then there is another level that is greater than what that it is the greatest power and that is the level of resurrection at that level is the greatest power and it is possessed only by god and his son jesus christ look at luke chapter 1 verse 35 luke chapter 1 verse 35 luke chapter 1 verse 35 are you there look at verse 35 and the angel answered and said unto her the holy ghost i come upon thee and the power of the highest i have overshadowed thee therefore also that only thing which i be born of thee shall be called the son of god he said the power of the highest that's the greatest power it's only god that can demonstrate that power and jesus also can demonstrate that power it is the power of the higher and the reason why jesus christ can demonstrate that power is because holy ghost was not given to him in measure god give everything call holy ghost to him look at john chapter 3 verse 34 john chapter 3 verse 34 look at john chapter 3 verse 34 look at verse 34 for he whom god had sent speaketh the word of god for god given not the spirit by measure unto him god does not give the spirit by measure to jesus he gives him everything called holy ghost everything he possessed every measure of the holy ghost when he was on the heart so he manifested the greatest power because nothing was reserved when the father was giving the holy ghost to jesus christ he gave everything to him that's why even the devil recognized that jesus christ can turn ordinary stone to bread look at luke chapter 4 luke chapter 4 he knew he can do it that's why he was using that to tempt him luke chapter 4 i read first three to four luke chapter 4 i read first three to four luke chapter 4 first three to four let's read together and the devil said unto him if thou be the son of god command this stone that it be made bread jesus answered him saying it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word of god he knew jesus has the ability he knew jesus has the power he can convert ordinary stone to bread he can convert ordinary stone to human being jesus can do anything but he wouldn't abuse the power of god he want to use that power for only thing that is according to the will of god jesus possess all power all power all power look at john chapter 11 john chapter 11 i read verse 25 john chapter 11 i read verse 25 john 11 verse 25 jesus said unto her i am the resurrection and the life you see that he didn't say i have the power of resurrection he said i am resurrection he's fool he is the one he has all power in heaven and on the earth look at matthew chapter 28 matthew chapter 28 matthew chapter 28 i read first 18 matthew 28 verse 18 let us read together look at verse 18 and jesus came and speak unto them saying all power 
He has all power. He has the greatest power. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He has all power. All power. All power. That is the kingdom we belong to. We belong to the kingdom of power. And because we belong to the kingdom of power, God also wants us to share out of this power. The question is, how do we receive the power? We receive the power from the word of God. That is why we must be preaching the word of God anytime we gather together. Because once the word is coming out, it's coming out with power. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 4. Let's open our Bible together. Ecclesiastes chapter, 4, chapter 8, verse 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 4. Ecclesiastes is after the book of Proverbs. Chapter 8, we read verse 4. Look at verse 4. Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? Where the word of a king is, there is power. And the word of God is the word of king. And as the word is coming now, we begin to receive power. We begin to receive power. We begin to move from one level of power to another level of power. We contact the power of God through the word of God. Even as you are hearing me right now, you're already contacting power. Something is flowing into you. You are receiving anointing. You are receiving power. You are moving into the next level already. Something is flowing into you. Look at Ezekiel chapter 2. Ezekiel chapter 2. I read verse 1 and 2. Ezekiel chapter 2. I read verse 1 and 2. Look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 2. And he said unto me, Son of man, stand up upon thy feet and i will speak unto thee and the spirit enter into me when he speak unto me and set me upon my feet that i had him that speak unto me anytime god speak into you anytime the word of god come unto you you receive the spirit you receive the power you receive the anointing something is flowing to you even today something has flown into you whether you feel it or not you have received the power of God. That is why we preach the word of God. Anytime we gather together to worship God. You remember, we are we two days ago we are talking about the place of word in worship. That's why we preach the word of God in our worship. That's why we preach the word of God anytime we gather together. Because the word of God will convey power into our life and we ask ourselves the other time the reasons why we preach the word of god in our worship we gave us eight good reasons number one we talk about purpose of worship number two we talk about meaning of worship number three the power of the world number four becoming like god number five battleground number six entanglement with the world number seven empowerment and number eight abrahamic example we say these are the eight reasons why we preach the word of god anytime we come together and to the glory of god we have already explained number one which is the purpose of worship and yesterday we also explained the meaning of worship today we want to talk about the power of the world the power of the world the power of the world that is reason why we preach the word of god anytime we come together let's see second timothy chapter 3 verse 16 second timothy Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Are you there? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. I read verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That is the reason why we preach the word of God when we come together. Because the word of God is profitable, number one, for doctrine, profitable, uh, number two, for reproof, number three, for correction, and number four, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture is given by inspiration. 
for you to understand the meaning of inspiration there are other two words you must understand their meaning we have inspiration we have revelation and we have illumination revelation is to reveal something that is not known before that is the meaning of revelation look at deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 29 deuteronomy chapter 29 Verse 29, we are talking about the meaning of revelation. Look at verse 29. The secret thing belongs unto the Lord, unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the works of this law. You see, those things that, 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 that are revealed, that is, that have been uncovered, that have been made known. It wasn't known before. That's why he says secret thing belongs to God. Those things that are not meant to known to us are the secret thing. But when God has made certain known to us, that is revelation. When he has uncovered certain truth, when he has revealed certain truth, that is revelation. So the meaning of revelation is to uncover something that is hidden before. To expose something that was hidden before that is the meaning of revelation then number two illumination illumination is to make you to understand a refill truth a truth is already refilled but you are reading it you are asking yourself what is the meaning of this thing you don't understand when you when god when god shed light on that revelation it becomes illuminated you receive the understanding understanding of the refill word is what is called illumination look at daniel chapter 9 daniel chapter 9 i read first one daniel chapter 9 i read first one in the year in the first year of dairos the son of Asurius of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of his reign, I Daniel understood by books the number of the year we are of the word of God came to Jeremiah the prophet that we accomplished 70 years in the dissolution of Jerusalem. Daniel said he understand it. Perhaps he had been reading that place before, he never understand. But that day, there was, a, there was a light from heaven that was shared upon that portion of the scripture. He has the understanding of what God is saying that day. That was That is what is called illumination. So then, inspiration. We are talking about revelation. We are talking about illumination. Then what do you mean by inspiration? Inspiration is the way and the manner you receive the revealed truth. It's not God has revealed it, but the way you receive it into your spirit. Inspiration means that God breathing it into your spirit so that it doesn't mix with your opinion. It doesn't mix with your thoughts. It comes raw. It is delivered into your spirit raw. So the way and the manner by which refill truth is received is called inspiration. Let's come back again to Second King. Let's come back again to Second Timothy chapter three. Second Timothy chapter three. I read verse sixteen again. Second Timothy chapter three. I read verse sixteen again. So when the Bible say all Scripture is inspired, you now understand the meaning. It's talking about the way and the manner prophet receive it from God. It wasn't mixed with their own thought. It wasn't mixed with their own opinion. It was delivered into their spirit raw, pure. Look at Second Timothy chapter three, verse sixteen. Second Timothy chapter three, verse sixteen. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. As we receive the word of God, because it's the word of God, there is no human opinion there. There is no human thought there. It is pure. Look at Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. I read verse twenty. Knowing this first, that no prophecy or the scripture is of any private trans interpretation. Prophet doesn't have his thoughts in it. 
prophet doesn't have his opinion about it. It is delivered pure into the heart of the prophet. It's delivered pure. There is no private interpretation in it. Look at verse 21. For the prophet, for the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but the holy man of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So there is no mixed opinion, mixed point, mixed feeling inside the word of God. It is a pure word of God. And it is good for four purpose, for four purposes. It's good for reproof, it's good for correction, is good for doctrine, it's good for a reproof is good for correction is good for instruction these are the four things that the word of god does in our life we need it that's why we need to be preaching it anytime we gather together look at second timothy chapter 3 verse 16. all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrines what do you mean by doctrine he set out principles for us principles in every areas of life things we ought to know things we ought to do things we ought to know it gave us principle for instance it gave us principles to follow in marriage look at matthew chapter 19 matthew chapter 19 i read first one to see we are talking about doctrine the principles of the scripture, the principle that he allowed for us to follow in every area of our life. Look at Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, I read first one to see. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished this saying, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan, and great multitude followed him, and he hid them there. Verse 3, the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is he lawful for a man to put away his wife for every call? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them female, male and female? For this, for I said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave unto his own wife, and they shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twin, but one flesh. What therefore God that joined together, let no man put asunder. You see, Jesus Christ was telling the people that are talking about Mary, Have you not read? Because the word of God contains the principle you should know about marriage. When you are looking for teachings on any subject, the first book to contact is the Holy Bible. It contains principles on every area of our life. And you see the principles here in verse 4. And he answered and said unto them, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? So marriage is between a male and female. It's not between a male and a male. And it's not between a male, female and a female. It's not between human being and animal. Marriage is between a male and a, 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 a female. That is the first principle. The second principle is that when you say you are getting married you don't get married to your father's house you don't get married to your mother's house you create a separate home for yourself look at first wife and he said for this cause a man leave father and mother and say cleave to his own wife you must stay away from your parents if you want to have a happy home you are starting a new family there mustn't be any mix-up you must stay separate on your home, he said. And he said, for this cause, I man, leave father and mother, and I cleave to his own wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Fasces, wherefore there are no more to him, but one flesh. Wherefore God, we have what, what therefore God has joined together. Let no man put asunder. The Bible gives us principles on every areas of our life principles on every areas of our life you see the doctrine about marriage is also for reproof when somebody has done something that is bad we use the word of god to know how we are going to rebuke the person how we are going to discipline the person 
how we are going to talk to the person. For instance, you see in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you see a man who committed adultery, how he was disciplined according to the word of God. So it is the word of God that makes us to know how to reprove. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I read verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I read verse 1. Look at verse 1. He said, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication as is no so as is no so much as named among Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And he are puffed up, have not rather more that he that's done this thing might be taken away from among you. For fairly as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has done as I so done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. It is the only Bible that tells us how to discipline, how to deal with people that have gone astray. It's also for correction. And it's also for instruction, instruction, instruction on how to do things, instruction on how to heal the sea, instruction on how to cast the devil, instruction on how to do all these things. Without the Bible, we will not know step-by-step -step approach to certain things we ought to do. It's the Bible that gives us the instruction. That's why anytime we gather together, anytime we are together, we need to preach the word of God. We need to talk the, about the word of God. We need to preach the Holy Bible. That is the only way we can fulfill our purpose in life. Because as we are listening to the word of God, we get principles on certain issues of our life. As we are listening to the word of God, we are reproved, we are rebuked, we are disciplined for certain things that we are doing. As we listen to the word of God, it's correcting us in certain areas where we are making mistakes, where we are taking the wrong step. It's also giving us instruction on how to do certain things. So this is the reason why we need the word of God anytime we gather together. And I believe the Lord has spoken to us today. He has blessed us in today's lecture. And we need to go before him in prayer that we are not going to be the hearers of the word alone, but we are going to be the doer. Let's talk to God in prayer. Let's talk to him in prayer.